My name is Vivian Benazzi. I'm a Program Director for Bioinformatics at Extramural NHGRI. I'm Elliot Margulies, and I'm a Basic Researcher. My name is Jeff Schloss. I'm a Program Director in the Division of Extramural Research at NHGRI. My name is David McGoy, and I'm a Basic Researcher. Uh, my name is Eric Green. I'm the Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I would consider myself uh, both a basic science researcher and a clinical researcher. We were hearing about this Human Genome Project at that time. This was before I was at NIH, obviously. Um, I think many of us thought that that was an unbelievable dream, probably very far off into the future. I've never really experienced not having a genome. I mean, some scientists of my era don't know what it's like, which maybe is a good thing because Whenever we need to look up a gene, we can type in a name, a gene pops up, we have the sequence information, we have expression information. In 1999, uh, we had, over the past several years, mostly over the past three years, uh, accumulated data on about one-tenth of the human genome. We had obtained about 2.4 gigabases of raw data uh, for the, from the human genome. That was enough to put together about 10% of the human genome sequence. Uh, the plan was for the subsequent year to put together about uh, 16 gigabases of human genome sequence data, and that would be enough to sequence about 90% of the genome at reasonably high draft quality. Um, those are worldwide figures. Having the sequence the human genome is like turning on the lights in the room and finally knowing what you're looking at. If we jump forward to 2004, you could sequence one human genome uh, in about three months with 100 machines. I mean, nothing that I do could be done without a genome. I mean, it's, it's core to research. Today, we could sequence the same amount of DNA that it took three months with 100 machines in 2004 with the current technology, we can sequence that amount of DNA in about one day on one machine. In terms of warp speed, with the volume of data increasing exponentially, then the need to be able to figure out all of the processes for informatics just exponentially goes up. So our need for uh, our knowledge of computer science to be able to handle this information and to be able to build appropriate scalable tools just increases exponentially as well. So we have fancy big monitors, that we uh, spread the, the reference sequence along the, you know, the top part. And we have browser, web browsers that um, house the genome and databases. I absolutely do take it for granted. I mean, I'm sure the uh, older generation doesn't, but I certainly take it for granted because I've always had it available to me. It's just a given. And so it would be a shock if I was to work on an organism without a sequenced genome, I think. So my work uh, here at the NHGRI is to really leverage the next generation sequencing technologies and apply them and see what we can do with them. Oh man, we, could not, we certainly could not have done this 10 years ago. One thing that's really been enabling our project here is the acquisition of next-gen sequencing. And uh, these machines, especially the, uh, the, so the platforms that we use today, are only a, a few years uh, old. And in fact, the acceleration of sequence uh, acquisition is, is astounding. These next generation sequencing technologies are fantastic. The amount of human, or any really, kind of sequence that comes out of the machines is, is fantastic. Uh, basically, we can use it to detect variation, to uh, detect breaks in the DNA, uh, really just to examine not only uh, one genome, but really many genomes and, and just find out what's going on. The issue is that we've, what we've got now is we're trying to figure out what that data means. So we have to have the data in a format that you can actually use. So we have to have, otherwise it's the Tower of Babel. I'm Dave Bodine. I work in the genetics and molecular biology branch. And I would probably describe myself as a translational researcher. Uh, try to stay in between the very basic things and some of the more clinical things. My name is Keisha Finley, and I'm a basic researcher in the lab of Dr. Julie Segre. My name is Sean Burgess. I'm a basic researcher. My name is Heidi Parker, and I'm a basic researcher. When we study hematopoiesis, which is the production of blood cells from a very undifferentiated stem cell in the bone marrow, and we're particularly interested in how that stem cell 
makes genetic decisions to differentiate into red blood cells, which you make about two billion of them every second. We generally use zebrafish uh, as a model organism where we, we can study uh, and experiment on, on these fish to study the, the function of genes. The research I do here is to study copy number variation. This is a type of large-scale genetic variation that affects uh, large deletions and amplifications of genetic sequence in our genome. Well, what I'm studying in the lab is uh, focused on whether or not fungi are found on our skin. The Brody Lab is interested in one carbon metabolism and that um, one carbon metabolism is a, a set of pathways which uh, are important in underlying development and they uh, relate to uh, like dietary vitamins. I study dog genomics. So what we do is map all sorts of traits in dogs, either morphologic traits, uh, disease traits, and sometimes even behavioral traits. Um, and by what we do is we use a lot of information gained from the genome sequence in order to do that. The kind of research I do basically aims to understand disease as a function of both genetic risk factors and environmental risk factors. The question that we've been working on at the NHGRI is to try to understand how does genomic variation affect uh, phenotype. I love genetics, and like I said, I, 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 that's my favorite way to uh, tackle a problem because geneticists are the, 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 in my mind, the vanguards for understanding. They're the ones that get the first look into uh, how a gene works. We started getting into dogs was because dogs get a lot of different diseases, a lot of inherited diseases, and they're the same diseases that humans get. What we've done is try to see if we can sort of focus in on this one exposure, house diastomite exposure, and apply that to an to an uh, animal model where we can then survey their genome instead of the human genome. So what we do is essentially we have a population of mice that you can think of as a population of humans and we expose them to dust mite and basically see who respond, which mice respond and which don't and then correlate that with the genetics of each of those mice, their genomes essentially. We know that malassezia, which is a fungi, is found on human skin on your face and your scalp, causes dandruff, etc. But the question is are there other fungi present on our skin? And so if there are, are these fungi at the healthy, in a healthy individual, can you see the fungi on your skin and um, determine whether or not uh, they have, do they play a role, normal role on your skin? And then if we look at disease, skin dis disorders, are the fungi also responsible for causing these disorders? Well, a lot of the tools we use are actually computational tools. So the data sets that we're using now are huge data sets. And we're looking for big changes. So some of um, some of what we've been using are these large-scale sequencing machines, these next-gen technologies. The basic question is to identify the genes that control traits that are important not only in dogs, but in humans as well. So that always leads us to disease. We look at a lot of different cancers in dogs. They're showing us new biology. How do we connect the dots, really? The human genome was, was really a gateway genome uh, that allowed other vertebrate model systems uh, that, that were used to study human diseases uh, they gave him a roadmap of how to do a genome, how to do it. It's pretty easy to go back and forth between the two. And when we line them up, we'll look at dog and mouse and human and some of the others that have been sequenced. And oftentimes, human is our closest match. Well, I think we're kind of moving with our results from basic to the clinical. It's just the nature of the work that we've been doing. We've kind of evolved into the position that we are now. In 10, 20 years, I really feel like science will continue to grow and to progress and we'll see that most people are probably going to start getting their genome sequence and so personalized medicine will be real and not just something we're talking about right now.